Amen. Good morning, morning. and happy Sabbath once again. Let's pray as we begin the study today. Father in heaven, help me please, and be here with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been looking at Daniel, and we are continuing in Daniel chapter 7. So if you open your Bibles there to Daniel chapter 7, and we looked that as a review in Daniel chapter 1, that Daniel was a stranger in a strange land. He wasn't a Babylonian, yet he was in Babylon. And yet being a stranger in a, in a strange land, he still kept what God told him to do. And we too are strangers in a strange land. This is not our home. If this is your home, enjoy it because it won't last. If this is your fun, enjoy it because it will end soon. If this is your freedom, enjoy it because it's going away. But we have a better home. A better home. And Daniel knew that he had a better home. And so we looked also there in Daniel. We've learned that God rewards consistency. Daniel was consistent, especially there when he prayed three times. He didn't close his windows. He didn't take a pause. He purposely let everyone see, but he was consistent with his faith. He was consistent with his prayer. Even his friends were consistent in not bowing down to the image. There in Daniel chapter 3. And God rewards consistency, friends. God rewards consistency. How consistent are you? How consistent am I? How consistent are we? You see, there are some that only come to church whenever CACS sings. Or whenever maybe their, their favorite preacher is going to be in town. Or maybe whenever a certain group is going to sing, they come to church. And God, friends, is looking for consistency. Only those that are consistent are going to make it to the kingdom of heaven. Because Jesus says, if you are faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in the great things. You will be faithful in the greater things. So we need to be consistent. And every time a chapter ends in the book of Daniel. I don't know if you've noticed, but Daniel gets promoted. Daniel gets promoted. But yet he is still a slave. He is still a captive. He's still not free to go back home. He starts off in chapter 1 as a slave. And here in chapter 7, we're going to see that he's still a slave. He's still a captive. <clears throat> He, we, start off, we started off in Daniel chapter 1 as Daniel as a young man. And here in chapter 7, he is an older man now. And he gets a vision. And this vision is almost a duplicate of the vision of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. <clears throat> but at the end of the vision... At the end of the vision here in Daniel chapter 7 that we're going to look at, God is telling Daniel that he will set up his kingdom and that he is giving him his kingdom. Now today's sermon, today, the sermon for today is not about the prophecy. It's not about the prophecy, but about the message in the prophecy. And there's a reason why. There's, there, there's a reason why. I'm not gonna, we're not going to get into the details of the beast, of the horns, and the little horn. As Seventh-day Adventists, 
If you, if you have been a Seventh-day Adventist for quite a while, this should be a no-brainer for you. Amen. Amen. It should be. Seventh-day Adventists are known, I was going to say it used to be known, but no, we still are known of people of the book. People of the Bible. And so we, for most Seventh-day Adventists, Daniel 7, we already understand it, and we have preached it from this pulpit several times. And when Pastor Eddie Perez was here, he also preached it as well. So you have been given the prophecies. And we will still continue to prophesy because the Bible says, keep prophesying. But today's message is not so much about the prophecy, but about the message in the prophecy. We will get into the prophecies actually this summer, especially here in Daniel 7 and how it affects us in the last days, especially dealing with the Sabbath. In the summer, we're going to deal the whole summer with the Sabbath. So if you don't want to hear a sermon about the Sabbath, don't come during the summertime. We're going to see how the Sabbath is affecting even Seventh-day Adventists today. And how even more it will affect Seventh-day Adventists and all the Christian world around the world. But today the message God has given for us is in the midst of all that is going on, He is still going to give you and I the kingdom. So there in Daniel chapter 7 verse 1. Let's, let's begin there in verse 1. And we're going to see that this, it begins with animals. There it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and a vision on his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold, for the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great seas. And the four great and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and its was lifted up from the earth and was made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. Verse 5. And suddenly another beast, a second like a what? <clears throat> like a bear. It was, raising, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. But after this, I looked and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back, on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now, verse 7. And after this, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had how many horns? Ten horns. Now, as I mentioned, we're not going to get into the prophecies, but those who have studied the prophecies, you know that they match the image of Daniel chapter 2. Of Daniel chapter 2. The, the lion here, the first beast, matches the head of gold, which represents Babylon. The bear matches the arms and chest of silver, which represent the Medes and the Persians. The leopards here represent the belly and thighs, which represents bronze, uh, Greece, which represented Alexander the Great. And the four heads and the four wings are the four generals that continued after Alexander died. The beast, the verse 7, the dreadful and terrible beast represents the legs of iron of Rome. There's even a similarity there, that the bees had iron teeth and the statue had iron legs. 
And the ten horns here that the beast had represent also the ten toes that the statue had. And so we see the similarities there on, on how it's a vision repeating Daniel chapter 2. The same kingdoms. But yet there's something different in this one. See, in this one there is a little horn that comes out. In the statue of Daniel 2, there isn't a little toe that knocks out three toes. No. But in this one, it gives us more information that one little horn comes out and knocks out three other horns. And it gives the description. So Daniel sees, Daniel sees the same pattern. Here in Daniel 7, 17 and 18, Notice 17, chapter, no, verse 17 and 18. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. Just how we saw in Daniel chapter 2, there were four kings, four kingdoms. So here, the same thing in Daniel 7, 17. But notice verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Forever and forever. It matches here in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Daniel 2, verse 44 says, after he gives the whole interpretation, it says, And in the last days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. So it shall last forever and ever and ever. In Daniel chapter 7, Notice here the pattern of good news and then bad news and then good news and then bad news, okay? Daniel chapter 7, verses 7. They're talking about the fourth beast. And I saw in the night vision, and behold, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly great and strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking, trampling with its feet. It was different. And notice verse 8. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first were plucked out by the root. And there in this horn were eyes like a man, and a mouth speaking, what kind of words? <clears throat> Pompous words, evil words, blasphemy. So here Daniel is worried. This this, this horn, this kingdom is, is speaking pompous words, blas blasphemy words. Now notice, now notice verse 9. Right, right after that he says, he sees and says, I watched till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated. Who is that? That's God. His garment was white as snow and his hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels of burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered before him. Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The courts were seated and the books were open. This, this is a positive scene. First, you see the scene of a terrible horn, dreadful evil stomping over, over everything and speaking pompous words. And then the next scene that you have is the thrones put in place. God coming down, taking his place in throne, opening the books and judging. It is a judgment scene. And here thousands and thousands are ministering before him. So he's kind of see something positive like, oh, good. But notice verse, now notice verse, let me see, verse 21. I watched, I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. So now he sees another negative scene, you know, that it's not just 
speaking evil things, but now it's prevailing against the saints. It's prevailing against the saints. And thank God the, the Bible doesn't say that it prevailed over the saints. Amen. It doesn't prevail over the saints. It was prevailing against the saints. And then notice verse 22. Until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints. So first, first, they were against this little horn power. And the little horn power was prevailing, was winning, was dominating. But then the next verse gives light and gives courage and gives hope. Until the ancient of days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the what? The kingdom. Time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Did you see the pattern there of, of bad and then it gave good news and then it looked bad and then the saints would possess the kingdom positive again? There was good news and bad news, good news and bad news. And friends, what type of Christian are you? Are you the type that gets tied up only on the bad news? Only on the bad news? You see, in these last days, we're going to need to be people that believe through the bad news. Amen. Daniel didn't get his head down and just said, yeah, the kingdom is coming, but oh, he's going to prevail over us. No. He kept his head high because he knew that God in the end would win. The saints would get the kingdom. The, this horn would be judged and would be destroyed. In order for us in the last days, friends, to make it through, we need to believe through the bad news. Through the bad news and keep on trusting that God will fix it. Amen. Keep on trusting that God will fix it. Because it's it's human tendency to believe that bad news is going to last forever. And it, and it doesn't. It doesn't. In this chapter, Satan may prevail, but the saints are going to get the kingdom, friends. The saints are going to get the kingdom. Now notice verse 23. There in ch chapter 7, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth which shall be different from, from other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break into pieces. The ten horns are the ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be different from the first one. He shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given shall be given into his hands for a time and time and half a time. Notice verse 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. So not just speak against the saints, but against God. Shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Now I'm reading from the New King James. Does somebody have a King James Version? What does it say? Shall what? Wear out. Wear out the saints. Wear out the saints, friends. The devil is going to wear you out. The devil, friends, is going to persecute you. The saints shall be given into his hands and you will be worn out. It's right here. The Bible is telling us so let's not think that we're not going to get persecuted. We're not going to get worn out. Everything will be fine and dandy. Uh-uh. He shall speak pompous words against, against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Who are the saints of the Most High? God's people. We are. You should have said we are. If you're not, why aren't you? Amen. 
I am a saint of the Most High. We are the saints of God. And yet here the Bible is telling us that the devil is going to wear you out. You know, sometimes we are worn out by our own children. <laughs> they wear you out. They can really wear you out. Sometimes we can get worn out by our spouses. Amen. Sometimes people at work can wear you out. The people that you spend time with. And we need to be kind and gentle, don't, don't we? But sometimes we want to make a fist and line somebody up. Because they keep wearing us out. They keep wearing us out. The devil works in wearing you out. And most of the time he uses people to wear us out. To wear us out. If there is anything that you cannot afford to do is to lose your sense of destiny. You can't lose your sense of destiny. Because we were born to be saved, friends. God made us and bought us. We belong to him twice. So I'm not going to let anyone rob me of that destiny. I may get worn out. My children may wear me out. Once in a while, my lovely, beautiful wife may wear me out. And vice versa, of course. But we are not going, we should not let that rob us from our destiny of salvation. We should not, friends. Devil, the devil will do anything to wear you out and to get you discouraged. He may even use the church, which he, which he does. But Daniel will tell you that on this earth you are going to remain a captive. Just like Daniel. And Daniel remained a captive. He never went home. He died out of Jerusalem. But yet he knew that he would possess the kingdom. He knew that God was still in control. He knew that even though the devil wore him out year after year, king after king, he knew the end. Daniel never went back and he died a captive there. But yet, Daniel did not let go of God. And God let Daniel know that the day will come that the saints will possess the kingdom. You see, the first time he let Daniel know, he was a young man. A young man. In that vision in Daniel chapter 2. But now Daniel is a much older man. And Daniel maybe could have, get, could have gotten discouraged. And thinking, is God ever going to do anything we are still here in Babylon. Now we're, it's in a different kingdom. And yet God reminds Daniel that he is still in control and that Daniel will still possess the kingdom. But before, friends, before we possess the kingdom, Satan will wear us out, will persecute us. The way the saints possess the kingdom is to take out any attachments they have of this world. The way we possess the kingdom is by taking out any attachments that we have to this world. Would you agree, would you agree with me that we are too attached to the things of this world? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We are. If we were to lose electricity, would that make a difference? Would we fall apart? <laughs> I know there are some ladies in this church that cannot do their hair without electricity. <laughs> if we were to lose our phones, oh yeah, that's a big O. If we were to lose our phones, would we fall apart? <laughs> My phone goes with me everywhere. It has, it has everything I need. We are too much attached to the things of this world, friends. 
And during the, during the last days, the last moments, some of us may be in caves, may be in the wilderness, may be in prison, and we need to be able to be okay without the attachments of this world. Amen. Without the attachments. And some of our attachments even wear us out. And the devil uses our attachments to wear us out. Not just people, but even the things that we are attached to. To wear us out and to get us away from the study of his word. A day does not go by. A day does not go by that I do not get a call, an email, a text, a notification, an alert, something on this little thing. A date does not go by. How much attached am I to this? The devil will use everything. Every single thing. If I really want to spend time alone with God, I have to detach from my phone, from everything. From the television, from the computer, from my family, and spend quality time alone with God. It's not a coincidence, friends, when you read the Bible, that all of God's great men and women spend time in the wilderness alone with God, away from distractions, away from distractions. So, God, so the devil will use even our attachments to wear us out, to wear us out. Sometimes you just want to relax and the phone goes off, or an email, or an alert. And you may think, I'll check later, but it keeps vibrating, beeping, until you answer it or do something. Now notice there in verse 25 of chapter 7. Notice there. So the devil is going to wear us out, not only wear us out, but he is beginning to change things. There it says, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and laws. Now, in the study of prophecy, this is a direct change to the Sabbath. But, there, but it deals more than just changing the Sabbath. A lot of God's principles will be changed, friends. And the times have, the, the, the times have changed and the laws are being adjusted for the times that are being changed. Because the times are changing, certain laws are being adjusted to fit the times that are changing. You want, you want I can give you two easy examples. Same-sex marriage. Those, those have times changed? Absolutely. Now the, now the United States and most of the world is, is accepting and recognizing same-sex marriage. And so what is, the, at least in this country, doing? They're changing the laws to adjust to the times. This, this changing of law, times and laws deals with the Sabbath, but more than just the Sabbath. It deals with principles of God as well. What about respect for parents? Do children respect parents nowadays? Are the laws being adjusted because children don't respect parents? You know, the laws have been modified that now parents can't discipline their children. They can't discipline their children because they want, they'll get in trouble. And some parents are afraid of their children because they will report them. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <clears throat> Report me. <laughs> if my kids try to report my wife and I, they better report us quickly. <laughs> Otherwise, they'll be missing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Friends, the Bible tells us what to do with our children. We love our children, but we discipline our children. We discipline our children. I remember a pastor when I was in high school preaching about, about discipline and parenting. 
And he said to the congregation, he says, parents, discipline your children before they rob me in 10 years. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Parents have a big responsibility, friends. It is not merely the, the church's responsibility to raise the children or the schools. We do participate, we do help. But God will judge the parents. <clears throat> so, how about the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Are we changing God's principles to suit our times? Hmm. Wow, wow. Well. Are we adjusting God's principles to suit our times? Oh, friends. How many times have I heard, well, we live in different times. The culture expects me to wear a wedding band. God gives us his principle. Well, we live in times that it's expected for me to come in one Sabbath out of three months. God gives us his principle. As Seventh-day Adventist friends, times are different, but the principles of God do not change. Amen. The principles of God do not change. God still expects his men and women to be holy, to walk holy, and to be an example, to be a light to the world. We are to be different. Daniel was a stranger in a strange land, and many Seventh-day Adventists our home in the world and not strangers in a strange land. I remember my father telling me there used to be a time when you could tell a Seventh-day Adventist. Now you have to ask him, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? It, it's, it, it is not... No, let me, let me say it this way. As I, as I said it before, it's okay. It's hip to be square. It's okay to be different. God's people are different. That's why God says, do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world or the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in them. It's not in them. So God expects us to be different and expects his church to be different and not change the principles to suit the times. To suit the times. But there in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, God gives Daniel assurance and hope. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. See, after hearing and seeing this evil little horn, he says, I watched till thrones were put in place. What did God do in the middle of the vision? He gives Daniel the kingdom. And then he sees God. And not only that, look at verse 13. I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the, with the clouds of heaven. Who is that Son of Man? Jesus. Daniel saw Jesus, God, before the incarnation. One like the Son of Man coming. That was Jesus. And look at verse 14. Then to him was given domitian and glory and kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. And dominion, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. That is exactly, friends, just how Daniel 2.44 is. He is re re reminding Daniel, <clears throat> reminding Daniel that he is still in control. There, Daniel 2.44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. 
The visions of God are solid. The visions of God are true, are sure. And God is reminding Daniel, now as an older man, hang in there. I told you when you were younger that this kingdom shall not end and I will come soon. And I am reminding you today. And friends, in Daniel 2, Daniel was a young man when God gave him that promise. In Daniel 7, he was an older man. And he is reminding him the same thing. And I am reminding you today that he that sh shall come will come. Amen. He that shall come will come. And too many of us are losing faith and losing hope. Among the beasts and the horn and the little horn, what is God really saying? I have set up my kingdom and I'm giving it to you. I've set up my kingdom. I'm giving it to you. Isn't that what, what Jesus told us there in John 14? See this? We, we even have this same message in the New Testament. John 14, verses 1 through 3. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. He could be talking to Daniel. Don't worry about it, Daniel. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't worry about it, Cleburne. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Isn't that what Daniel saw there in Daniel chapter 7? The same thing. The saints will possess the kingdom that will last forever and ever and ever. So friends, friends, church, don't lose hope. Not now. Your redemption is nearer than when you first believed. Is the Bible true? Are you sure? Yes. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews for a closing text. Hebrews chapter 10. Is the Bible true? Yes. Are you sure and you can trust the word of God? Yes. Your salvation will depend on it. Your salvation will not depend on our personal opinions. God isn't interested in what I think. He's interested in how I listen to him and obey him. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. He was telling Daniel, you will possess the kingdom. You got to have faith, Daniel. Now the just shall live by faith. But notice, what's the next sentence? But if anyone draws back, what does that mean? If anyone gives hope, loses hope, says, you know what? I've waited too long. I can't, it's, the, the devil is just wearing me too much out. That's it. I'm throwing in the towel. <clears throat> Jesus didn't say that the way would be easy. Here. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Have mercy. God wants us, friends, to be consistent. The devil will wear you out every day. You see, while you are sleeping comfortable at night, the devil is planning on how to get you in the morning. That's why it's important to wake up every day with your devotion. Get armed with the Word of God. Get filled with the Holy Spirit because the devil already has his attacks ready for you. And he's ready to wear you out. He begins in the home then continues at work, then continues with, in the road, wherever it may be, 
with your friends. He wants to wear you out for you to give up. But here we are, are told, yet in a little while, he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him, friends. God wants us to be consistent, even though the devil is going to wear us out. But God gives us the assurance and hope that he wins. He wins. And if he wins, and if I have my faith in him and my life devoted to him, I win. And you win. Everything here is, tempor is temporary. It's temporary. Whenever I go through a hard time, my mother would tell me, this too shall pass. Don't worry, this too shall pass. Whenever at the Charles home, we were shaken by many things. Our home has really gone through a lot. But every time my mom, this too shall pass, everything will be fine. As a child, we're like, what are you talking about? But it did pass. And friends, this world shall pass. Amen. And everything in it shall pass. Amen. And before we get into the prophecies of, of describing the little horn and Daniel and the ten toes and the kingdom, all that information is good. It's true. And we have it. We are, we are rich with information as Seventh-day Adventists. But friends, some of us are still struggling with the basics. Trusting God. Just trusting God. We want to get all this information. What does this beast mean? What are the prophecies? Who are the 144,000? What, what is the mark of the beast? We are going to answer all those questions, friends. But do not miss the basics. God is in control and you have to trust him. Amen. And you have to trust him. Don't change God's principles to suit your time or these times. Just trust God. Just how I heard one time Pastor Wright, I don't know if anyone knows who Pastor Henry Wright is. He was preaching a sermon and he said to the, con to the congregation, church, just shut up and do what God says. <laughs> Friends, my opinion, your opinion, means nothing. God has given us instruction and He showed us. He has showed the old man what to do. He has showed the old man what to do. So before we get into all these prophecies, friends, God is assuring Daniel and assuring you and I that he is in control. This little horn, this power, this blasphemy will not last. The wearing out that you are going through will not last. It too shall pass. Just hang in there. Trust God and do what he says, friends. Just trust God and do what he says. I want to thank the Lord for helping me today with my voice. Amen. And I want to invite you that your hope is built on nothing less than the rock of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that you trust Him in every aspect of your life. Next Sabbath, friends. Oh, next Sabbath. We're covering Daniel chapter 8. We're not going to get into the prophecies. But there is a message important for us. And I invite you to come next Sabbath. But for now, friends, just trust what God says. You know, I should have chosen trust and obey. But I like this hymn too. But before we sing... I just want to make a short appeal. You don't, don't come to the front. Pray in your heart and talk to God. 
if you have compromised any of his principles, if you have listened to his voice and not done what he says, now is the time to repent. <clears throat> now is not the time to draw back. Now is the time to draw near to God. Draw near to God. Put away all this foolishness. Put away all the opinions that you may have. We know what God says and we know what God expects. And we can only do it with the help of God. So if there is anyone here who wants to continue doing the will of God, I want to have a word of prayer for you. And I invite you to stand. And if there's anyone here that needs to repent, you have compromised God's principles, you, have, you know what the Bible says, and somehow we try to justify it because we live in the 21st century, there is nothing wrong with good old-fashioned Seventh-day Adventist theology. Father in heaven, Lord, you have given Daniel the message that you are still in control. You have broken out many details about this beast, but Lord, sometimes we want to fill all of our heads with information of Bible truth, but lack trusting in your word. Trusting in your provision. Trusting in your guidance. And we turn to our thoughts. We turn to our opinions. Or we turn to others. Or other pastors. Other leaders. Lord, forgive us whenever we have done that. Forgive me whenever I have done that. And help us to turn to you. And seek you first, for you tell us everything that we need to know in your word. Bless your church. Bless your people, oh God. I thank you, Father, for hearing my prayers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.